you follow along on the screen. Well, Father, tonight as we look at your word and such a good day today, such an awesome chance to be together tonight, would you teach us, you put the book of Jonah in the Bible for a purpose, and would you teach us what you have for us to learn from that tonight? In Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. 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 This story, well, first of all, it's so important because it's in the Bible, but it is extra significant because the largest number of people ever to repent at one time are the people in Nineveh that Jonah went and preached to. So this is it. I mean, other people of various numbers from one to a few thousand to whatever, this particular case, at least 120,000, can you imagine? 120,000 people repented and came to faith in the Lord. And it did not take place in a church. There was no church, especially no church that large, right? And, and um, all they had was idol temples. They worshiped idols. They, they were not God-fearing people at all. But Jonah chapter 4, verse 11, actually we can start right there. I know it's chapter 4, but we'll show the end result. Jonah chapter 4 and verse 11 says 120, while well, I'm looking at the blank screen, I can say it by heart, 120,000 people came to faith and repented. Now, um, where is Nineveh? I, I, I Googled it and I found out it's only a 18 and a half hour drive away. I found out that wasn't so bad until I realized there's a Nineveh in New York. <laughs> And this did not happen in Nineveh, New York. It happened in Nineveh in the Middle East. Nineveh was the oldest and perhaps the most populous city of the ancient Assyrian Empire, located on the Tigris River, and it's encircled by the modern city of Mosul, Iraq. Now, did you that that rings a bell with me that when the Iraqi war was going on, you heard a lot of reference in, reference to Mosul. Did you, was Mike there by any chance? Mosul or Mosul, I'm sorry, I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, but you kept hearing it and it was very significant during the Iraq war. Um, it's about 120 miles north of Baghdad. And when I Googled it at 11.30 in the morning, 7.30 p.m. their time, the temperature was 104 degrees. So kind of like Las Vegas, a very, very warm place. 2 Kings chapter 14 and verse 25 mentions Jonah. It says this, he restored the coast, speaking of the king of Israel, Jeroboam, he restored the coast of Israel from the entering of Hamath unto the sea of the plain, according to the word of the Lord God of Israel, which he spoke by the hand of his servant, who? Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet, which was of gath Hepher. So there you see Jonah mentioned in the Bible, his prophetic word caused there to be a restoration of some land that Israel had lost to their enemies. He was a Galilean. He was from an area near Nazareth, which is of course where Jesus spent most of his time. Let's uh, read Jonah chapter one and verse 17. We're not gonna read the whole story, but if you want an interesting read, for especially for your kids, um, you would have a captive audience about a fish and a, you know, a whale and a man swallowed and all that. It's quite the story. Jonah chapter 1 verse 17, when, when the Lord told Jonah to go and preach to Nineveh, he did not want to do that, so he heads the opposite direction towards a place called Tarshish. And while he's on the boat, of course, this storm comes along, which you saw in, in the video. Verse 17 says, the Lord had prepared a great fish, most people interpret that to be a whale, to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. I did some research, so you don't have to do research, so you can just go home and be much wiser than you are now, right? Uh, whales have four stomachs, and their digestion takes place in phases. When whales eat, they swallow their prey whole. That would have been Jonah, so just swallow whole, okay? And, 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 and then whatever they have just eaten is pushed into the first stomach, which is called the rumen. 
The rumen is where food is stored and begins to be partially broken down. The tissue of the rumen does not create digestive juices. This means that the contents in this first compartment could hold a food item, Jonah, without him breaking down chemically, at least for a while. I've heard cows have like umpteen stomachs, like almost a dozen or so, well whales have four. Some wonder if there's enough air to survive in a whale's stomach. Okay? In the rumen, there, there tends to be no oxygen as uh, microbes within that organ cannot live with oxygen present. This is true if you have a healthy rumen. However, air can be present in the case of ruminal tympathy or bloating, as it's called. This would have been the case with Jonah. Whales breathe air, and if its stomach is upset, it would be coming up frequently for more air and possibly swallowing some in. Aren't you glad you learned that? <laughs> there have been several reported cases of modern sailors or other individuals swallowed by such an animal only to be recovered many hours later. So this type of thing happens. Now, did it happen for three days for other people that we know of? No, but consider this, one of two things happened. Number one possibility. Jonah survived in the belly of the whale and it was a miracle. Because the whole story is a miracle from the storm that spontaneously stops through the fish spitting Jonah out on the ground to the repenting taking place of over 100,000 people. The whole story is a miracle. Okay? So, he, so you, can, you can say he survived and it was a miracle or he died in the whale and was resurrected and that's a miracle. What's the common bond here? It's a miracle either way. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 40, Jesus is talking, and in this statement, he's either a Lord or he's liar. There's no in between. That's true for everything Jesus says. And he says this, as Jonas, or Jonah, was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Interesting, huh? So what happened to Jesus? His three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, he died and was resurrected. So if you want to say that possibly was Jonah, whichever, point being, it was a miracle. Jonah chapter 1 and verse 3. I don't know. Here we go. Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish. We already mentioned that from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa. He found the ship going to Tarshish, so he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Listen to this for a moment. If you want to run from God, the devil will always provide the transportation. Isn't that true? If you want to run from God, the devil will always provide the transportation. So Jonah's in the belly of the whale, and then he prays, so he's alive at least long enough to pray this prayer. I personally think he was probably alive the whole time, but like I said, whichever of those two thoughts you choose, it's okay. Look at this prayer, Jonah chapter 2 and verse 3 through 5. For thou hast, he's praying this in the belly of the whale. For thou hast cast me into the deep, into the midst of the seas, and the floods compassed about me. All thy billows and waves passed over me. Then I said, I'm cast out of thy sight. But then he says, you talk about a prayer of faith? Yet I will look again towards your holy death. The man's in the belly of a whale. And he's praying and saying, yet again I will look towards your holy temple. Verse 5. The waters compassed about me, even to the soul. The depth closed me all around, and the weeds were wrapped around my head. Well, I guess if you're in the belly of the whale, you're probably going to have some weeds wrapped around your head. Now, verse 9. But I will sacrifice unto you with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that that I have vowed salvation is of the Lord. If Jonah can say that in the belly of a whale, you can say that with whatever situation you're facing, right? Because there's no record pre-Jonah of anyone ever getting out of the belly of a whale, right? But Jonah says, I will sacrifice to thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay what I have vowed. What do you think he vowed in the belly of the whale? Lord, 
I'm your man. <laughs> Send me to Nineveh. I repent. I will go and I will do what you have asked me to do. In reading this story, I got four lessons from uh, that we can learn from Jonah. I encourage you to write them down, think about them, see how they apply to your life. Lesson number one. God cares more about the lost than he does with us having a comfortable life. That's just the way it is, friend. God cares more about the lost than he does with us having a comfortable life. Look at verse 4, Jonah chapter 1 and verse 4. The Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest, or, or in other translations, a violent storm in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. And now verse 15. So they took, so they looked, took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from her raging. Whether God directly caused that storm or it was Jonah's disobedience that opened the door for the devil to do it, is not our focus tonight. I'm not going to get into that. I'll let you mull that over and come to your own conclusion. Point is, Jonah disobeyed the Lord. There's 120,000 plus lost people, and God cares more about those lost people being, being um, people of faith than he does about Jonah's comfort in life. Now, I know John 10.10 10 speaks about abundant life in Jesus. And us Americans especially, we, we like those kind of verses, right? Um, but please, make sure that you are buffeting your flesh and not befaying your flesh. Now, I don't know if befaying is a word, but I made it up, so it's for, for tonight, for the next half hour, it's a word, okay? Um, what a difference, huh? And Paul said, I buffet. That means his body, his flesh, he treats himself harshly. Make sure you're buffeting your flesh, not buffeting your flesh like we all do when we go to Pizza Ranch or other things, right? Now, the abundant life that Jesus talks about is in the context of us denying ourselves. It's in the context of our sinful self being crucified with Christ and us no longer living, but Christ living in us. I, I'm so glad that I've had the opportunity to, uh, to be in different cultures, different countries, because you can learn everybody's not like you. And one of the things I, I, I discovered that still just, just amazes me to this day with European Christians, especially Eastern European Christians, if something is difficult and hard, that's their first um, understanding that this thing is probably from God. If it's difficult and it's hard, it's probably God leading you to do it because things God wants you to do aren't necessarily easy. The American church, we tend to think if something is easy, and smooth and doesn't take a lot of effort, that's God. Well, is either one totally right? I don't think either one is 100% right, but you get to the point. There's a whole lot of Christians in the world that think if something isn't difficult and challenging, it's not really even worth the effort. Whereas American Christians, we tend to think if it's not easy and not a piece of cake, we don't want anything to do with it. So, you know, we, we got to watch out for that. <coughs> Remain don't do like Jonah did. Remain under the umbrella of God. Remain under the protection of God's umbrella or else those storms will be nasty. Right? You want to stay under the umbrella. Because <laughs> if you don't, it can get nasty out there. And the umbrella is obeying, obeying the Lord and what he's asked you to do in your life. How many have heard of Ray Comfort? He's, uh, he works with Kirk Cameron, does a lot of street evangelism. Evangelism. He says, what keeps me from running from God? What keeps me from running to his Tarshish? He says, a mixture of compassion for the lost and a healthy fear of God. Isn't that good? A mixture of two things will keep us doing the right thing, even if it's the difficult, hard thing, is, is, a, is a fear of God and compassion for the lost. Look at Philippians chapter 2 and verse 12. This would be a great refrigerator verse. 
just a great refrigerator verse. It says this, Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed. This is a good one to tell your kids when you go out and you leave your kids home alone. You know, when they're grade school teenage years. Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now what? Much more in my absence. Work out your salvation with what? Fear, that means a healthy respect for God, and trembling. I just bet you there's a whole lot more trembling in the presence of the Lord from Christians in communist countries than there is in us Americans. Because we're not used to having to, you know, have that type, type of respect, life or death type respect for someone. So number one, realize that God is more concerned about the loss than he is our comfort. Number two, never underestimate the value of one act of obedience. Never underestimate the value of one act of obedience. Who would have thought one man, one simple message, and the greatest number of people to repent recorded in the whole Old Testament? Let's look at Jonah chapter 3, verse 3 and 4. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days journey. A lot of people think that means it took three days to walk through the whole city. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey and he cried and said, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So one man, he didn't look too good at this time. We'll talk more about that later. One simple message and the greatest turning to the Lord that has ever take place, taken place. John chapter 4, verse 23, in the New Living Translation says this. Jesus replied, all who love me will do what I say. My Father will love them and we will come and make our home with each one of them. I want to talk about obedience for a minute, but realize that as, as was talked about in the freedom video that we watched here a couple of weeks ago with Pastor Chris Hodges, freedom out of, or obedience out of love looks a lot different than obedience out of law. Obedience out of love says if you fall in love with Jesus, you will automatically obey. Obedience out of law says you've got to prove your love for me by doing what I say. There's a big difference between the two. New Testament way, you fall in love with Jesus. Jesus says, go to Nineveh. You say, Lord, when do you want me to go? Simple as that. Now, make a lifestyle of obeying God in the little day-to-day -day things. Then likely when a big thing comes up, you will be able to say, yes, Lord, I will do that. Amen. Whatever God is leading you to do with your church, whatever it is, maybe it's a simple thing. Maybe it's fix up a room, right, Mandy? Maybe it's make a sign. Maybe it's, maybe it's do something else. No matter what it is, don't underestimate the value of one simple act of obedience. It sure can mean a lot. Very well-known minister used to say this to his children. He, he said, kids, you have two choices in life. Serve God or die. You choose which one you want to do. Well, that's kind of harsh, but it's kind of the way it is, right? We serve God or something, a death happens to us, ultimately even spiritual and physical death if we, if we take it to an extreme. Okay, number three. So number two is never underestimate the value of one simple act of obedience. Number three is, ooh, this one's going to hurt, folks. You ready for it? You ready for it? Our flesh, untouched by the Spirit of God, is utterly wretched. Let me say it again. Our flesh, untouched by the Spirit of God, is utterly wretched. Jonah chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. It, it, the, so the whole city repents. Jonah walks through it and says, Within 40 days, Nineveh will be overthrown. The whole city repents. And this is what happens. It displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became how angry? Very angry. Verse 2. Now, this may be the key verse 
in the whole story right here. Jonah knew this. And this is Old Testament, but God's the same in the Old Testament as he is in the New Testament. It's just that the covenant that be, through the blood of Jesus that gets us into his presence is different in the New Testament. But, but look at this. And Jonah prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this by saying when I was yet in my country? Jonah did not run away because he was afraid. Jonah ran away because he was afraid the people in Nineveh would repent, and he was the greatest racist that ever lived in his day. And he didn't want the people to repent. He wanted them to burn, baby burn. He did. He went up and he set himself up a little shelter in the side of the city, and he's just sitting there, and he's waiting for the flames to start. To see the arch enemy of the nation of Israel get what he felt they rightfully deserved. And, and, and then he says here, he says, Lord, Lord, yes, I'm highly disappointed. Because I, when they didn't burn. Because I knew that you are a gracious God, merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness. And it ticks me off that you don't want them to burn like I want them to burn. Do you need further example, folks, that our flesh, untouched by the Spirit of God, is utterly wretched? I mean, Jonah's a prophet. We're not talking a heathen here. We're talking a prophet of God. We're talking the best that God had to work with. And he's standing there ready for the burn party to happen, and it's not happening. And he gets majorly upset. Go down to verse 9. He gets upset about something else too. He doesn't care about the 120,000 people dying and going to hell. He cares about the fact that he had built himself a little shelter. I forget now if God had provided it or if he had built it. The point is, he had a little shelter to keep him, to keep him cool from the desert, hot desert sun. And, but, but, but God sent a worm. <laughs> and, and the worm ate away it. It calls it in the King James the gourd. And again, this wretched man of a prophet. God, I mean, God says, are you angry about that gourd? Are you angry about that shelter, that plant that I caused to grow up? And the worm came and ate it. <laughs> and uh, Jonah says, and he said, I do well to be angry even unto death. Wow. Jonah, the prophet of God, folks, is a proud, stubborn disobedient, unfaithful, grumbling, altogether bad-tempered, cantankerous old man. In case you missed that, Jonah, the prophet of God, was a proud, stubborn, disobedient, unfaithful, grumbling, altogether bad-tempered, cantankerous man. He finally arrives at Nineveh, Strides vench, uh, vengefully through the city, announcing doom and destruction on the people in 40 days. And then he goes to his shelter, and he waits for the burning to happen. And when nothing happened, he got so angry, and he got so upset. Jonah wanted them to perish in their sins, and Israel would be rid of their ancient so why did Jonah disobey God? Not because he was a coward, because of a false sense of patriotism. He was a, he was a racist. He was an extreme racist. And to him, pagans were untouchable. And that God should take an interest in them was utterly unthinkable. They deserved nothing but to burn, was what Jonah thought. Romans chapter 7, verse 18. Lest we think that just applies to Jonah. Paul, the great spiritual giant who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, says, I know that in me, in my flesh. How many are still in the flesh? You know, one way we can prove, to, one way we can, a test we can do to determine if you're in the flesh. Put your hand here. Is your heart still beating? Okay, that's, that's, that's part number one. Part number two, take two of your fingers and go... Come on, come on, please. I'm preaching. You're supposed to do what I say. Take your two fingers. Did you feel it? Did it hurt a little? You're still in the flesh. 
There's one way to, to get you out of the flesh, and that's for you to die. It's the only way over on planet Earth will ever stop being in the flesh is if we die. Until that time, we have something called flesh. And Paul said, in my flesh, and if it's true for him, it's true for me, it's true for you. In my flesh, ah, there's some good and there's some not so good. Is that what he said? No, he didn't say that. He said, in my flesh dwells what? No good thing. He's an utterly wretched, sinful person just like Jonah was in his flesh. In his flesh. Um, flesh can be trained. In fact, that's what it has to be or we get in a whole heap of trouble. It can be trained to yield in the spirit, to yield to the spirit, but it can never be trusted. Never, ever, ever. Jesus, sinless, never did anything wrong, never once in his life trusted his flesh because flesh will always take you down a wrong path. So it can be trained, but it can never be trusted. Now, lest we think we don't have issues with the flesh, I saved this story out of World Magazine a few years ago, and uh, it fits right here. So it's a story of Susie Christian, Susie Christian going to the local grocery store, and this is her 17 minute drive home from the local grocery store, and these are just some of the thoughts she thinks about during the 17 minute drive home from the local grocery store. She stews over a comment her brother made behind her back and thinks of sending him a text to tell him off and sounding righteous in the process. She reviews the, the, the morning's argument with her husband and plans the evening installment. She lets a car merge into traffic and then gets ticked off when she doesn't get her wave to merge on herself. She, re, she resolves to eat less chocolate starting today. Well, maybe tomorrow. She passes the house of the contractor who defrauded her and fantasizes blowing it to smithereens. <laughs> she passes Audrey working in her garden and waves, but thinks if Audrey has chronic fatigue syndrome, I'm a flying Walenda. She glares at a driver who runs a red light in front of her, forgetting that she did the same thing about a mile ago. She checks her slightly crooked nose compulsively in the rear view mirror and reassures herself it's really not too bad. An inner voice tells her to turn off the radio and pray, but she decides that's the voice of legalism, so she doesn't do it. She brainstorms talking, up, talking points for her upcoming women's Bible study on Ephesians and considers how she can make it better than Alice's talk last week. She's angry at God because she's a Christian and broke while her good-for-nothing heathen brother is rolling in the dough. I'm not even reading all of them with you. She counts the ways her parents have screwed up her life. The Johnsons drive by and she recalls all the meals she made for them 10 years ago when Lydia had toxema, toxemia during pregnancy and bets they don't even remember. Hmm. Did they even send a thank you card? She determines to try harder to live righteously from now on. Who knows, God may, re, may reward her in some way by, uh, wait a minute, I'm not going to read that part here. I'll go down this part. There are lots of other people the woman did not think about while driving home those 17 minutes. People who are not important to her social status. She didn't think about people dying of AIDS in Africa. She didn't think about the death sentence hanging over millions in the Sudan. She didn't think about missionaries. She didn't think about the martyrs in Kim Jong-il's prisons in North Korea. And if you ask the lady, as she rustles parcels from the car, what she'd been thinking about on the drive home, she would say, oh, nothing in particular. Last line. And imagine believing we don't need a savior. Huh? Imagine believing we don't need a savior if all those thoughts, those sinful, wrong thoughts can just go passing through a mind in 17 minutes. Bitterness, jealousy, resentment in our flesh will do to our soul what rust does to steel. All right. Now, number four is a little bit better. Number three talks about in our flesh dwells no good thing. Number four. Last one. 
God will use anything and he will use anyone to reach people. Let's read that together. I'll bow. God will use anything and anyone to reach people. There was a belief in Nineveh based on mythology, not based upon Christianity, that said this. One day, a half-fish, half-godlike creature will come into Nineveh. The principal goddess worshipped by the Ninevites was Ashtara, but they also deferred to the god Dagon, who had a man's upper body and a fish's tail. Jonah would have been bleached completely white from his hair to his toes by the acids present in the belly of the fish, and on sudden appearance of this ghostly figure from the waves, the fishermen may have been convinced that this was Dagon's message, and they fell down in worship. And there we have a picture of the, the mythical creature that one day the Ninevites were waiting to come into Nineveh and tell them how to know God. And here comes Jonah, stinking, smelling, seaweed, as hard as he tries to get rid of the seaweed, there's still some there, you just can't get rid of it all. And he comes stumbling into that city in Nineveh, repent, repent. And they, this is, and they go, this is it. This is who we have been waiting for. God will use anybody, and he will use anything to reach the lost. He will use mythology that people believe in, and he will use you and I to be the messenger. Now, if you say to yourself, I better clean up first, you might miss the opportunity. What would have happened if Jonah said, I'm not going to go stinky, smelly, wrapped up in seaweeds. I'm going to go home, take a shower, and get myself looking good first. Would they have listened to him? Probably not. At least to the extent that they did. If you're caught into this thing, well, I'm not quite good enough. I'm not quite spiritual enough for the Lord to use me yet. This has to happen, and this has to happen. Maybe the Lord wants to use you just the way you are. Just the way you are right now. I remember he liked to me before Bible school. You know, I'm 21, and I look like I'm 8, 17 years old. You know, what a problem to have, right? And, you know, it's like this thing, God can't use you. You haven't been to Bible school yet. You haven't been to Bible school yet. Okay, so you do the Bible thing, school thing, go to Bible school. And the same lie that he told me before Bible school, the same lie he told me after Bible school, he just kind of twisted it around a little bit. He will always come up with something to keep you from being instantly obedient to God. So I have a question for you tonight. Who and what is your Nineveh? What is your heavenly assignment to touch the world? Hmm? And have you been headed towards it? Or have you been headed away from it? And in the process of heading away from it, there's been storms, there have been difficulties. Everything just doesn't work out the way you think it should work out. I challenge you tonight to turn around and start heading towards your Nineveh, your heavenly assignment that God has given you. I love this story. I've shared it before in the workplace ministry. Um, little ice cream vendor from Thailand or somewhere. She, she had a card and she sold ice cream. And she got a revelation that she had an assignment to reach her Nineveh, which was her city, a very large city. The first thing she did is she prayed that God would cause her ice cream to be the best ice cream that anybody had ever had. And then she began to build relationship with people who were customers, and she began to quietly pray for them while, while they were there. And uh, first thing her customers did is say, did you change brands of ice cream? Because your ice cream tastes amazing. Well, of course it tasted amazing. She got God to make it taste amazing, right? And long story, shorter version, one by one she built relationship with this people. She went to a little tiny church. It was, you know, 50 people, whatever. Within one year, there were 700 people in that church, and 600 and some of them came directly because of that little lady who took her assignment to reach her Nineveh. And she prayed for people. She blessed them. She even ended up reaching the mayor of the whole city. And all she was was an ice cream vending type lady. The best decision, I read this in a, in a book by Ipso Bolso, and it, it, the best line was like the last line in the whole book. You had to read like 200 pages to get to this. The best decision 
we can make in our life is to invest the rest of our life in discipling people and discipling nations. Yeah, you. You who have seaweed wrapped around. You who smell like a fish because you, you went the wrong direction. You ended up getting some, 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 some bad odors from the world on you. Yes, you are the person God wants you to use. Shirley, can we run through those four points again? Is that possible? Right. Okay, great. Awesome. Let's go back. Let's do number one here because I know they weren't on the screen real long. Each one very significant from the book of Jonah. Number one, God cares more about the loss than he does with us having this wonderful, comfortable, Western, United States, American, Christian-type lifestyle, right? He's not against that. He just cares more about the loss than he does about that. Number two, never underestimate the value of one act of obedience. You know, it's possible that somebody in here will be called to do one act of obedience that will be the key to this church being filled up the following Sunday. Hmm? And when, when he's called you to do that one act of obedience, you may not have a clue. And it may seem like the toughest, toughest thing to do. Your flesh is going to recoil and not want to do it. But never underestimate the value of one act of obedience. Number three, yeah, just like Jonah, our flesh, untouched by the Spirit of God, is utterly wretched. Oh, do we need a Savior each and every day. And number four, God will use anything and anyone to reach and to warn people. He'll even use me, and he'll even use you. Let's pray together. Let's stand up and pray with you.